you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show dot com. The Chris Voss Show dot com. There's my opera opening, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know why you guys still like that thing after all these years. Uh, but welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys having us on and in your houses, rooms, homes, wherever the hell you're listening to us in the car. Uh, be sure to refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Give us that five star review on iTunes. Go to Goodreads dot com for Chess Chris Voss, YouTube dot com for Chess Chris Voss, LinkedIn dot com for Chess Chris Voss, the big LinkedIn newsletter and the big LinkedIn group over there. Follow that as well, and then. We're we're trying to be cool on TikTok, and guess what? It's not working because we're old and smart. I don't know. That was kind of rude. Why did I say that about the TikTok people? Anyway, guys, uh, we have an amazing returning guest on this show. He's been on the show five different times before. This is his fifth, actually, engagement. I believe, according to Saturday Night Rules, we have to either award him with a roll robe or a really shitty ceramic cup. So we'll see if we can't figure if we can find one around the house here. Uh, Tom Hartman joins us for the fifth time on the show again, and uh, he's got his latest a uh, brilliant book out. It's called The Hidden History of American Democracy. I've been trying to find uh, democracy hidden here for the past few years. Um, let me let me recut that. The Hidden History of American Democracy, Rediscovering Humanity's Ancient Way of Living. And this is part of his The Tom Hartman Hidden Series. Uh, and you can get this uh, July 18th, 2023. This came out. And uh, as I mentioned, you can see all the different, uh, I think, the last four books that we've uh, interviewed tom on the show uh just order up he's got a, like a whole ton of books they're quick read and they're awesome tom hartman is a progressive nationally and an internationally syndicated talk show host talkers magazine named him america's number one most important progressive host and the host of one of the top 10 talk shows in the country every year for more than a decade a four-time recipient of the project censored award he's also a new york times best-selling author with more than 30 books holy crap a moly uh they've been translated into multiple languages as well he was born in michigan and retains strong ties to the midwest although he has lived in many regions he now lives in the columbia river uh region in uh, portland oregon welcome to the show tom how are you Hey, Chris. I'm great. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks for coming. We certainly appreciate it. It's an honor to have you, as always. Well, we'll just keep doing this until we're 100. How's that sound? I don't know. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> writing so, the books. You keep doing the show? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'll keep doing this, man. I'll be in that rocking chair. i probably half out of my mind in Alzheimer's, and they'll be like, what are you doing, Chris? And I'll be like, and they'll be like, and then you can just go. Um, so give us a .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please, sir. Uh, probably the best is HartmanReport.com, which is my daily rant, or Tom.TV, T-H-O-M.TV, which is all about the radio and TV show. There you go. And your YouTube is a lot of fun, too, as well. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so uh, what motivated you want to write this latest book? You know, I've, I've, I've wanted to write this book for a long, long time uh, because there are so many uh, myths about American democracy, about what the founders had in mind, what the framers intended when they wrote the Constitution, mm -hmm. um, you know, what democracy is, where it came from, how it came about in North America 240 some odd years ago, uh, that I, I, I just for a long, long time, I wanted to lay this stuff down and, and uh, you know, into a book and, and finally had an opportunity to do it. So there you go. I'm halfway through reading the Federalist Papers for the first time. Is the Federalist? Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's deep reading. That thing's long. Holy crap. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it makes the Constitution look like, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, one of those uh, short things. So well, it was a sales pitch, you know. It was, you know, Hamilton and, and Madison were, it was a series of newspaper articles that they mm -hmm. published over about a year and a half in 1888 and early 1889 to, to convince people to vote for the Constitution at the ratifying convention. So they did a pretty good job. They did. I'm at the part where they talk about how maybe uh, if the military budget gets too high, it's, it might become a burden on society and budgets and stuff of the common people. And I'm kind of like, didn't we just approve $700 billion? Anyway, uh, give us a 30,000 overview of the book and uh, let's get into some of the deets. Well, I think one of the one of the really interesting things that I learned when I was researching this book is that um, you know we have this idea that democracy is this weird thing, this this unique invention that some slick 
uh, thoughtful, uh, you know, white European came up with and said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's do this. You know, it was Jesus, uh, right? Uh, well, you know the the argument is typically that it was Greece three thousand years oh, ago, Greece. and then uh, and then the Romans two thousand years mm -hmm. ago, and in fact, you know, our American democracy is not based on either the Greek democracy, which was a pure, relatively pure democracy. It, you uh, you didn't elect representatives. You had to have six thousand one people show up for a vote, and and it was like uh, jury duty. It was kind of a lottery. And the people that didn't show up when their name was called were called the idiota, which is where we got our word idiot from. Um, and whereas the Roman Republic, you know, they had a Senate. Yeah, we have a Senate, but that's about the only thing that's in parallel. You know, they, they rapidly uh, turned into basically tyrannies. Um, but it turns out that, first off, democracy is the default mode of human beings and all other animals. There was a study that was published in Nature back a little over a decade ago by uh, two British scientists, Conrad and Roper, uh, arguing that uh, we have anthropomorphized the king, the animal kingdom. That, that we, in fact, we call it a kingdom. We, you know, we we uh, think that animals are organized like old European society, where you've got an alpha animal that runs the show and tells everybody what to do. And they said, you know, that's nonsense. Uh, what you're going to find is that most animals, all social animals actually make decisions, group decision-making uh, through uh, voting, by, through a democratic process. Oh, wow. That yes, there are alpha animals, but the only thing, the only choice that they have above all else or above all others is the first choice of uh, sexual partner, of, of mate. And that comports with uh, Darwin's theory of natural selection, you know, passing along the strongest genes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I should they, add that to my Tinder profile. There you go. And so they, they published this, and uh, James Randerson and a couple of other scientists decided to put it to the test, and they, they uh, uh, observed a herd of red deer in a forest near the University of Essex, and, and there were three watering holes nearby, and the question was, you know, how did the deer decide when to go to the watering hole, and how did they decide to go, which, you know, which one to go to? Mm -hmm. And what they found was that the, they'd be out there grazing, and then over time, the various animals would start pointing their bodies at one of the three watering holes. And when 51% of them were pointing at one particular watering hole, the whole herd would just go, boom, you know, off, off we go to that watering hole. Mm -hmm. um, and so I called up Kent Rock Conrad, you know, one of the, one of the scientists and said, you know, what happened when you published this result? And he said, oh, we heard from everybody. He said, you know, the uh, bug guy called, you know, an entomologist. He said, you know, we're working with balls of gnats. You see in the summer, you see a ball of gnats, you know, yeah. and they're, they're in the air and then they kind of zoom over three feet to the left and then they go off, you know, how do they, do, how do they know to do that? You know, and there's no, you know, alpha gnat. Uh, it turns out that with every wing beat, they do slow motion photography and discover this. With every wing beat, each gnat is voting. And when more than 51% of them move three degrees to the right, the whole ball of gnats moves three degrees to the right. Same thing with fish, with schools of fish. The same thing with fish, with, or with birds, with flocks of birds. So democracy, it turns out, is the default mode for all animals that are social animals. And there's only a very small percentage that are not. Um, number one. So, and, that, and we're animals and we're social animals. So democracy is our default mode. And when you look at societies that have had multiple thousands of years without conquest, mm -hmm. without interruption, which is not European society, we were conquered 3000 years ago, or Europe was conquered 3000 years ago by the Celts, and then 2000 years ago by the Romans, and then 1000 years ago by the Catholics. Um, but when you look at societies that have had literally thousands and thousands of years to do trial and error experimentation about the best way to live, what you find is that the vast majority of them are governed democratically. Mm. And, and, and most of them actually are also quite egalitarian. They do, they do not allow for massive accumulations of wealth or horrible poverty. And um, so then the question is, you know, how did this, how did this start, you know, here, here in the United States where, why, you know, where did this idea come from? And, you know, we're often told, well, it was, you know, rich or not rich. It was, uh, you know, smart white guys from Europe. Uh, you know, it was the Greeks or the Romans. And as I said, it wasn't, you know, our democracy wasn't based on the Greeks or Romans. Um, actually, uh, then when you puncture that bubble, then people come along and say, well, you know, it was the Enlightenment philosophers, you know, uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Jacques Rousseau and, and uh, you know, John Locke and Montesquieu and Diderot. And it turns out, yeah, you know, those guys were major influences on most of the founders and the framers of the Constitution. But where did they get their ideas? And that's where it gets really interesting. And, and I was just fascinated doing the research for this book that 
back in the early 1700s, the French trappers had made deep inroads into the eastern part of the Midwest, you know, the in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, the western uh, Pennsylvania, New York State. And, um, and, and brought with them the French missionaries, the, the, the Jesuits. And the Huron tribe uniquely uh, accepted them, welcomed them, in fact, and traded with them. And uh, they taught the Hurons French, and the French taught them democracy. And, they, and, and these, uh, go ahead. I was going to say casinos. Yeah, no. right. That came later. Um, and so the, uh, the, the French fathers, these, these priests, these evangelists, started in the 1720s, started writing basically an annual letter to Europe about their experience living among the savages. And uh, they told these fascinating stories about how democracy worked among the Hurons. Mm -hmm. And this became, these became these annual letters that persisted for about 40, 50 years, became major bestsellers, uh, first in France and then across the rest of Europe. They were translated into multiple languages. And another phenomenon was going on at that time in Europe as well, uh, particularly in France, which was called salons, where wealthy women with large houses would invite a guest speaker, a, a, a famous person, to come in and speak to the local intelligentsia and the, you know, the barons and the lords and ladies and whatnot. And that would then provide you know, fodder for days of discussions afterwards. And so all of the you know wealthy women of france wanted to have one of these hurons come over and talk to them and the hurons spoke french and so the the french missionaries organized several trips where they took huron leaders over to france and they participated in these salons and they were just openly uh, uh disparaging of the french aristocracy of the wow. french class system wow. of uh, the great wealth and great poverty that they saw around them uh, you know, they, they just, you know, gave it to them. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, you know, John Locke references one of these salons in, in a footnote in one of his books. Uh, Dennis Diderot attended one. He was uh, John Jacques Rousseau's best friend. Um, uh, Rousseau was knowledgeable about them. Uh, Thomas Hobbes may, may have even known something about this, although he was writing earlier than most of this. And so it turns out that the way that the idea for democracy made it to many of the founders, not all of them, because Jefferson, Adams, and, and uh, Franklin in particular knew the Indians really, really well. Jefferson's father uh, was a map maker and he traveled around Indian territory in Virginia for, you know, for Jefferson's whole entire life and used to bring his son with him. And he spoke multiple Native American languages and uh, the Native Americans used to stay at Shadwell at the family farm uh, frequently. Um, but for the ones who didn't know about, you know, who hadn't, didn't have personal intimate contact like Franklin, you know, Franklin spent 30 years of his life as the U.S. envoy to various Native American tribes. For the people who didn't know that, it was the Enlightenment philosophers, particularly Rousseau and Locke, um, uh, who uh, transmitted that idea to the founding generation here in the United States. So it went from the Hurons who had developed it over 10,000 years of trial and error to France, and then from France back to the colonies. And then the colonists were like, oh, this is a great idea. Let's do what these European Enlightenment philosophers are suggesting. There you and go. That's how we got our democracy. Just another thing, France surrendered to us. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Hi, folks. Here's Voss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching speaking and training courses website you can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com over there you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements if you'd like to hire me uh training courses that we offer and coaching for leadership management entrepreneurism uh podcasting corporate stuff uh with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as ceo and be sure to check out chris voss leadership institute.com now back to the show so uh what you know i had i had uh thomas e ricks on the show i think it was uh i don't know if you're familiar with him uh thomas e ricks he wrote uh, first principles what america's founders learned from the greeks and romans and how that shaped our country uh -huh. and he he pitched that whole uh a thing about he's a pulitzer prize winning journalist he's written a lot of books about history and so i, I was i was interested in what you were saying about how this comes from that era and not so much the the other thing well, the Greeks and Romans, 
had the earliest known examples of attempts at self-governance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they deserve a lot of credit for that. And, and you know, the, but, uh, you know, Aristotle or Socrates, rather, I mean, you know, he participated in the, in the, 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 the rebellion of the 300 and of the 30. I mean, he helped bring down the Greek de democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, and the Roman, the Roman Republic, you know, it was a great experiment while it lasted, but it didn't take very long for the Caesars to become Caesars as opposed to what we would call a president or something like that. So, yeah, so yeah we, we did learn a lot from them, but um, I think the, the really essential ideas um, were more grounded in the Iroquois Confederacy, frankly. There you go. I'm going to have to read up more about that. I think I remember seeing something about the salons years ago and, and how they would go. And I think it was like, you know, it was basically like the early housewives of Beverly Hills and they just <laughs> wanted to see how hot the Indian guy was. It was like, it was like an early bachelor's. No, I'm just kidding. It was. Well, you know, two of the people who were real uh, common participants in these French salons were Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin. They both. Oh, were. there you go. So it's really and, interesting and to read the for, for, you know, hopping into bed with these women. There you go. Uh, if, uh, I mean, I think Benjamin Franklin, man, he was he got around, didn't he? I don't know. He did. He did. He was, he, was, uh, <laughs> he was quite the dandy. He was quite the dandy. Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, I'm reading the Federalist Papers, and it's so interesting to see the intent and then the, I mean, you know, so for, depending upon what happens in 2024, you could call it the final product. Oh! Um, so there's that, but it, it's interesting to see, you know, what they were thinking, what they were looking at. And, it, you know, they talk in, in Madison and, and them talk about, you know, all the different variances of what you're talking about, where they were taking and pulling, okay, well, this worked and this didn't work. Now you called the book in the title, the hidden history. Is this what we're talking about the hidden history or why did you choose to call it that? Yeah. Most people have no idea of the stuff that you and I just talked about. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so yeah i mean they just they just think yeah. columbus showed up and went hey man let's kick it here for a while and yeah, then all of a sudden you had uh pavement yeah. so there you go i think that's pretty much what most people whose education have failed them today has, has fallen in. now one of the things you build in the book is um it, it, it in celebrating uh the hidden history series it helps offer a call to action and a set of solutions for uh roadmaps for individuals and communities to create safer more society uh, how can we save our democracy? Um, uh, you know, the Civil War, you know, we're kind of in that polarized state right now. Everybody's, you know, looking at memes and, and living in those echo chambers, and we can't seem to find the middle. And, you know, a lot of people feel if we don't learn to get along as Americans, we're going to, we're, it's not going to work out well. Uh, right. I don't know what that means. It was like Ben Franklin's famous statement uh, mm -hmm. you know, around the time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. You know, if we don't hang together, we shall surely hang separately. <laughs> Like, you know, what, what is the, what is the line he said to, uh, he was reported to say to a woman when they came out that she says, do we have a democracy, do we have a democracy or do we have a, a She said, monarchy? what form of government have we? And he said, it's a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. As long as you can keep it. There you go. Um, anything else you want to tease out about the book? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's so important that people learn these facts and they learn about the true essence of their history. Well, in the, in the spirit of, uh, you know, democracy is our natural state and therefore whatever m the majority of the people, you know, within the context of the rights of individual humans, uh, whatever the majority of the people want is what we should have. Mm. Um, the, the fourth part of the book is 20 some odd proposed solutions for our democracy. And uh, all of them are things that poll above 50%. And all of them are things that most other countries have, you know, voting as a right rather than a privilege, um, a national health care system that's inexpensive and covers everybody and does a good job, um, a national educational system where you've got high quality primary, secondary and college uh, that's all very inexpensive, uh, a strong uh, social safety net, a strong social security system, Medicare, those kinds of things. And yet we don't have those. Because in 1976 and 78, five Republicans on the U.S. Supreme Court legalized political bribery. Then five other Republicans on the Supreme Court doubled down on that in 2010 with Citizens United. And um, so, you know, now we've got, as, as Jimmy Carter said to me seven years ago, he said, America is now just an oligarchy with political mm -hmm. bribery as the, as the principal operating principle of, of America. Um, it, we need to fix that. We need to do something about that. Uh, the, the, these Republicans on the Supreme Court have done really serious damage to our democracy and frankly put it at risk.
Definitely. And you wrote about that in your book. Uh, you came to us in January 20, uh, 27th, uh, 2021, The uh, Hidden History of American Oligarchy, Reclaiming Our yeah. Democracy. And I love that book. I've referenced it to a lot of people because it, you really surmise in that book, you know, Citizens United and all these things that aided us. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts after all that with, you know, all the stuff that's coming out with the court, you know, pretty much uh, being owned by billionaires? Well, you know, in 2010, when when the when the when the five Republicans on the court voted to fully legalize political bribery, both by billionaires and by corporations, they were simultaneously voting to allow their own bribery. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And, and then they the started pocket. putting their hands out. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we we made this great law. Now, uh, yeah. can we get a boat trip? Uh, yeah, some free exactly. shit. Exactly. Yeah, buy my thing. You know, it it, it it's just astounding. Like I. I think uh, most Americans thought that there was some sort of, you know, federal, like federal judges. They had some sort of ethics rules or they would behave in such a way. Well, there is a there is a law. There is a federal law that requires them to uh, make certain disclosures, and, and but they just ignore the law. And the problem is that, I mean, who's going to prosecute them? You know, the Department of Justice prosecutes them and, and they appeal the they appeal it to what? The Supreme Court. Yeah. And, and the Supreme Court decides whether it's a uh, rule or not. You know, like. Yeah. It's it's the most insane thing ever. Like we always live with this checks and balances bullshit, and and then all of a sudden it's like, wait, these guys are running the country now. You know, yeah. you're you're seeing the weirdness. You know, yeah, I think mm -hmm. I think right now what's going on in Israel is really you know with their recent decision for those watching years from now, the the recent decision to uh, limit the power of the Supreme Court. I don't know, maybe we need that. Um, but uh, you know, seeing what's going on there, authoritarian rules where PB is under investigation, and you know, yeah. that looks like a something that could happen two or three years from now. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's been indicted for bribery and corruption, and so hey, if you're the leader and you've been indicted for bribery and corruption, what do you do? <laughs> Blow up the court system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get prosecuted. Definitely. You know, we had Michael Waldman on the show. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He wrote the book The Supermajority: How the Supreme Court Divided America just a few weeks ago. I haven't read his book, but I'm familiar with him. Uh, and, great book. He talks about, uh, he, I guess he was on Biden's commission or the White House commission for uh, deciding, uh, I don't know, a think tank on the Supreme Court. But mm -hmm. he, it was limited. They couldn't make any recommendations. It was like, I don't know, they just sit around and talked about it. It's yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah, but I guess well, he's put a lot of cases before it. I think, I think Biden is afraid of, of seeming to politicize the court. And I'm yeah. sorry, that, that horse left the barn years ago. <laughs> You know, and I think we've talked about with you on your prior books, we've talked about a lot of authors on the show about Betsy DeVos's organization, Center for National Policy, and her father, you know, and, and their 40, 50, 60 year run to stack the court and, and stack the, uh, uh, what's the voting uh, the school? The Electoral College. The Electoral College. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What a game. The dog finally caught the car. Now the dog trying to figure out what to do with it. Of course, we're trying to figure out what to do with well, it as well. Well, it's going to be real interesting. The 2024 election is going to be real interesting because you got a, a, a lot of seriously pissed off women out there. Yeah. And, uh, and you got a guy who wants revenge who's, uh, you know, it's interesting to me. We're, as I'm listening to the Federalist Papers and talking about, you know, you and I about democracy, you know, we we have a guy who can take office just like Bibi uh, Netanyahu uh, in Israel, who's currently under multiple criminal investigations and more pending probably in the next two weeks. Uh, and he can literally take office without any, there's nothing blocking him from taking office. And certainly I'm, I'm kind of surprised, uh, I shouldn't be, that the Florida guy, governor, isn't uh, doing as well. But, I mean, he's kind of weird looking. Yeah. Um and acting, yeah. yeah. Well, the only prohibition on, on taking political office in the United States is having been convicted of sedition. You know, yeah. so you know, had they impeached Trump, or had they, or if Jack Smith charges him with sedition and actually gets a conviction, then Trump won't be eligible to run for office. But otherwise, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, uh, Eugene Debs, who is Bernie Sanders' hero, uh, you know, was a, a conscientious objector to World War One, and and Woodrow Wilson threw him in prison, and he ran for president from prison. And wow. got over a million votes. Did he really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So wow. it's entirely possible for Trump to run for, for president from jail, even as long as he's not, you know, as long as he hasn't been convicted of sedition. Yeah. And then, I mean, and I, you know, I, I think I heard someone talking about this. And basically, you have to count on the House and Senate to impeach him to get him back out. And you're just like, well, we missed the first two times. Like, what the? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, you wonder if Mitch McConnell is kicking himself for that, you know, because he he organized the let's not kick them out thing. Yeah, it's it, I love the intertwining of the history of the chess match when you see everything going. Although I I hope I love it. I guess we have to see how it turns out. I'm just kind of glad that I'm old. Because if it does go bad, then you know I'm just one of those senior citizens sitting around going, "Well, it was a nice well, it was a nice run while we had it." So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything I, more? I, I worry about the the generation coming up. I mean, they're going to yeah. inherit a world that is is going to be a real challenge. And most of them don't really understand democracy. Like I talk to a lot of young people, uh, and I, I game a lot with young people. I hear what's going on in the background. Fox News is usually playing twenty four seven. My my nephew and other people they're watching Fox News. They're getting all of their political education from memes mm-hmm. on social media. And I'm like, go read the Constitution. Go read the Federalist Papers. Go go understand what this is about. And then a lot of them, my understanding, you know, they're not really into capitalism anymore. And you know, they're like, hey, we kind of like socialism. Can we just get free handouts? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's kind of interesting. I was it's watching. Just... Go ahead. I was watching a, a guy today, I, I, I think he's a VC or something, but he was talking about how in all the other countries around the world, they've gone back to the office, and there's low office vacancy rates around the country, but we haven't. And I was sitting there thinking in my mind, what's the driving force to that? Is that are we just fucking lazy Americans, which we you know, kind of are? Well, I think you know, uh, America is a, a much larger, geographically, physically, a much larger country than... Mm-hmm pretty much any other major democracy in the world and uh, with a much lower population density overall. So, um, you know, in, in, in Belgium or in Germany or in France, I lived in Germany for a year, you know, people commute to work by hopping on the train. I mean, they've got really, really good public transportation systems that are very inexpensive and super efficient and very clean and nice. And um, we don't have that here in the United States. So instead people have to drive for a half hour or an hour to get to work, you know, each way. So it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, telecommuting, working from home here, mm. whereas it may be completely unnecessary in Amsterdam or in Frankfurt or in New York City, for that matter. Although in New York City, apparently they've got a lot of empty office space, but it may, it might be because a lot of people live out in the suburbs. You know? Yeah, that makes sense, though. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. That makes logical sense. Because I was trying to, I was like, yeah, what is going on with that? And, you know, we see challenges with the Gen Z and, and all that stuff. Uh, any new books that you have on the horizon? that you're working on anything you want to tease out i am i am uh i'm thinking about the next hidden history and the last one in the series being the hidden history of the american dream you know where Mm. where this whole idea of a middle class came from and how it built up and how it got knocked down by reaganism although the last book the hidden history of neoliberalism kind of talks about that so yeah i'm still debating it definitely uh so give us a audience a final pitch for your book to pick it up it's the hidden history of American democracy, reclaiming a, or uh, rediscovering humanity's uh, ancient way of living, and it's available wherever you find books. I mean, any any book outlet or bookstore, you can find it. There you go, folks. Wherever fine books are sold, stay away those alley bookstores because you, know, you might get mugged in them. Uh, thanks, Tom, for being on the show. We really appreciate it again. Thanks for inviting me, Chris. It's great to see you again. Thank you. And thanks, my audience, for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, and stalk us where we are on the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time. I should have-